safety for vintage racing was just don't suck. I had always wanted that Can-Am car. You know, the real thing of what the Mana Mirage was or something real of, I wanted to get that Lola T160 car that was back when I worked at a Ferrari dealership. So I had finished restoring a Lotus 11 Le Mans and there was a man who was interested in it and uh, making a deal. And oftentimes guys like to try to trade things from the collections. Maybe they got an old car they're never gonna do anything with. It's a way to move something on, get something fun and keep going. And he had a big collection. He was trying to throw different things my way. And I said, you know what I'd really love is a tube frame Can-Am car. He's like, hold on, have I got something for you. It was a, uh, a tube frame chassis made by Bob McKee. It was an early car of his. And Bob McKee made Can-Am cars. He was famous for building the Helmet turbine car. This was one of his early cars and it had his special, like nearly prototype transaxle on it, but it had a Lola T70 Mark III B coupe body on it, which is weird. It was unrestored. And as the story goes, there was some like Italian guy who owned it in the 80s in the Bronx and kept it in a parking garage and it had AC and a leather interior. I, it, was, it was a ridiculous story. I practically got it for free on this trade deal. And I'm like, yes, when can we do this? When are you coming? Great. <laughs> Made the deal, uh, got the car late in the year. I think it was probably November. And my place to work on cars was this unheated, uninsulated pole barn. And it was becoming winter, it was freezing. But I mean, I got a K&M car to work on and it's ratty and it's old, but I don't care. I mean, this is the best thing ever. And I start, you know, taking it apart and figuring out, you know, how am I gonna restore this? Also, I have like no money again. <laughs> and I had one little propane tank heater that you just kind of warm your hands just enough to keep working as hard as you can and not freeze. Cause it, you know, it'd be zero degrees in there. You work in the middle of the night in Ohio in winter. My great goal was to go to the, at the time it was called the Brian Redman International Challenge, which is now called the Hawk, I think. It's Road America, draws lots of spectators, but it's known as the Can-Am Reunion. I also started dating this girl from my hometown at the time who lived pretty close down the road and as the spring came she had a horse and sometimes she'd just ride the horse down the road in the countryside and hang out and it was just so cool. It was the most pure car guy experience anybody could have anymore again like in the 2000s. Like this is like something you'd think of would happen in the 60s. I'm a mid-twenties guy. I don't own anything but this stupid car. I've worked on it in a freezing barn, putting it together. The girl I'm dating lives down the street, rides her horse there, you know? At that time in the restoration, just the tires are expensive because they're Avons and they're slicks and then they have to be hand cut, the tread, like the old one was for the rules because it would be period for the time and all that jazz. I finally get the thing where it's running and go to test it. And I remember being out in the middle of Ohio, like literally cornfields, bean fields. This is uh, June. It was just the most amazing thing because you know those countryside evenings where the air is still and, and great in the summer and I'm test driving this and I remember going from a stop sign and just hitting it and it reminded me of Star Wars you know when they go to hyperspace and all the stars move but the thing that was cool in the evening the stars were the lightning bugs in the fields all just coming up like this and I'm Wah! I remember going by my girlfriend's house at the time and her whole family's coming out like what is your insane new boyfriend doing? Anyway, getting really close to the race, and of course, you know how it goes. You work until the night before because there's always little things to do. Honestly, I didn't know how to properly do setup or scaling on the car. My, my idea of setup was like, art. I'm like, eh, it looks like about the right amount of negative camber. Nah, toe, yeah, you know? The other problem was I had no way to get it to Wisconsin because I didn't own a truck or trailer or anything. I owned this car and I think a, like a C4 Corvette to get around in. My dad let me borrow his old kind of ratty steel open trailer. Family friend loaned me their SUV to tow it with. So I don't even own the crap to tow it there with. I used a, a European kart racing seat. It was fiberglass that was in there rigidly and I put a thin layer of red suede. The original roll hoop on this thing was just a hoop and it came up to approximately, this was the height on the side of my head. So my helmet was against the door like this because there was no gurney bubble. So, you know, I kind of had to drive it like this. Safety for vintage racing was just don't suck. The hot water tubes that were aluminum ran through the cockpit. So, you know, if you wrecked hard, you'd get, you'd get burned too with hot water, but maybe it'll put out the fire. <laughs> I didn't think this through, I was young. I'm like, wait a minute. I am gonna go race at a track that I've never been to in an international Can-Am reunion in a car that I just got done putting together with modest means and no setup. And I test drove it in the countryside with no bodywork on. Um, oh, and I'm also bringing a, a girl that I've only been dating for a month 
to go watch me do something ridiculous and we have to camp together. She's bringing like an entire comforter and pillows to camp with, like glamp. And I remember she looked like Atlas holding a globe of stuff. And I just looked at her and started laughing. I'm like, the last time I went vintage racing, I slept with the trash pandas underneath the tool bunch in a garage. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and the other thing too, which is amazing, I reconnected with Bob McKee. And it actually ended up being his second ever chassis he ever built. Of course, the body was different. But how I found him, and this is sort of funny, I, I heard back in the day he lived in the Chicago area. I called information. It, you know, cell phones weren't that big a thing in the internet. I'm like, I don't know what it was like, 411 or something. I'm like, yeah, Bob McKee. <laughs> so I dial it and the guy answers. I'm like, hi, sir, uh, my name is Casey. By chance, are you the, the Bob McKee that built race cars in the 1960s? <laughs> He's like, yeah, I did that. <laughs> I'm like, well, I think I have one of your cars. And I know, how, like, how bizarre is that? Bob invites me to paddock with all the McKees under this great big tent and just, you know, share costs a little bit. And he was like, I don't know, he charged me like 60 bucks or something. I show up, 20 something, this is like the only thing I own on a truck that I don't own in this ratty trailer my dad owns. And you know, of course you got like the Paps family with the scarabs and giant glistening trailers and Formula One cars and everything everywhere. And I'm like, hey, let me get the wood, get this thing off the trailer. <laughs> and I kind of hear in the crowd, I see a guy like three deep going like you know to somebody else and I can read body language I already know exactly what he's doing he's like I want to know where this kid got his money I said to my girlfriend I'm like did you see that guy I guarantee he was doing this at that moment a guy pops out of the crowd and goes yeah I'm his nephew he was he can't figure out if you're a trust fund baby or like made all your money on the internet with PayPal or something <laughs> and I'm like well man and then I told him a story he's like that's really cool so the races are coming up and it was blisteringly hot that summer I had fireproof underwear, like the two, three layer suit. I would sweat all the way through the underwear and the suit into the red suede of the seat, bad enough that the red dye would come off and into my white suit. And I was also totally gross because after doing this for like four days, and that's my only fireproof underwear and suit, you can imagine that the, the marination and the temperature and the sitting, and it was hung in the trailer, you just don't even want to go in the trailer, let alone wear this thing. Saturday, I'm all excited, but you know, being smart and mid pack, and there's another guy in a Lola T70, you know, proper one, monocoque chassis, more modern and all. And starting in front of me, I think, was Peter Revson's McLaren that was Ford powered. And there was another McLaren that had a Cosworth DFE, you know, like F1 engine in it. And then all of a sudden, Revson's McLaren goes over like this, and then the F1 powered one comes over like this. They all got slicks and like way better chassis development. And then they get hard on the brake because traffic checks up. And I'm like, uh-oh, I was already at full braking capacity. <laughs> and I had that big eye moment where I go, okay, I can either crash into the back of Peter Revson's McLaren, the F1 McLaren, or go off the track. I'll go off the track. <laughs> and so that was the extent of my first Can-Am race. I made it three turns, and I chose gravel over bodywork. <laughs> and I go psh, psh, like this in the gravel. And I'm like, I don't know what I do. I've never done this. <laughs> and I remember opening the door, and the turn marshals were like, get back. And I end up starting up and driving it offline and going back in and, you know, I was embarrassed, but I, I'm like, what, am I going to hit a car or go off? Whatever. I'm having a great time. We'll be back at it tomorrow. <laughs> you know, the first lap's great. You know, we're dicing. There's some tube frame McLarens I can hang with and get going. Of course, the big guys have checked out with a thousand horsepower and slicks. Because Road America is four miles a lap, something like that's uh, like the fastest road racing track in America, I think. Some of the fastest speeds. Going up to turn five where you crest that hill is the fastest section on the track. And then your braking is downhill. The brakes on my car were prototype for back then. They were some weird prototype General Motors brake calipers, which we restored fine with seals. And the, the, the rear ones were effectively like early Mustang brake calipers. I can't remember if it was one of the General Motors prototype brake calipers, one of the rear, but a seal let loose. And that was the moment where the car slightly yawed like this at top speed and my eyes got big and went, Hey boys, uh, stay where you're at, cause here I come. <laughs> and I, like, okay. So I'm on the brakes as much as I can reasonably. And I remember just snaking through all the cars like this. Meanwhile, my new buddy and my girlfriend are like, yeah, get some. <laughs> they don't realize that, you know, that this is not gonna, it's not gonna stick. So I, I miss all the cars, went off. Fortunately, it was an asphalt driver. I could turn around and keep going. Hey, it was exciting. And then afterward, everybody at the finish gathered around for a big Can-Am picture. That was kind of the first time that most of the other drivers ever saw me. So I was a 25-year-old kid, and when I took off my helmet, I well, th then I used to have all my hair. 
and they look at me like, who are you? Where did, where did you come from? Some guy's wife came up to me and uh, they were looking at the car, this is amazing, how'd you do this? And I was telling them the story and they got a Lola T70 and you know, of course he's got substantially more money invested in this. He's like, well, what, what do you got in this? How much did it cost you to restore it? And I'm like, uh, I got about $18,000 in the restoration. <laughs> Needless to say, that was by a large margin the least amount of money anybody had in their car um, and possibly the least amount of money they had in their weekend of anybody. I don't think I helped that guy's marriage at that moment. That car I kept for a while longer. I actually autocrossed it once, believe it or not. And I took it to mid-Ohio and had some fun track days and even did a concours. The, the girlfriend actually worked out for a while. That, that wasn't a bad, although she uh, lived up to the stereotypes of, of, of uh, being red-haired occasionally. Uh, we had a lot of fun though. And uh, I did find this out. If it's gonna be that hot and you're in that hot of a car, um, bring another driver's suit and or flame-proof underwear. Because after I was back and exhausted and got up the next morning and felt the call of nature, <laughs> it was the, uh, the fire of a thousand suns that I feel at that moment. I'd never experienced that in my life before and was very concerned. Yes, the doctor pinpointed my, uh, my marinated driving suit. So that was too much information. So moral of story, go Can-Am car racing, but bring a change of clothes. VinWiki is proud to be partnering with Mobile App Hero to continue changing the way we look at documenting automotive history. We're working with them to bring updates to our mobile and web-based app, so stay tuned to their social media and ours, and keep telling the stories of all the cars you love.